Okay. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. I'm going to get started. Okay. You're all able to see my screen, right? So hello, everybody. Thank you all so much for coming today. Um, I'm going to be presenting my CE called Where's the Undo Button? The Management of Common Medication Overdoses. So as for disclosures, I have nothing to disclose. And our objectives today, we're going to go over the pathophysiology, signs and symptoms, and management of acetaminophen, benzodiazepine, and tricyclic antidepressant overdose. And another objective is to understand how to use the RUMAC Matthew nomogram for the management of an acetaminophen overdose. So before we get started, I just wanted to see if any of you have an idea approximately how many drug-involved overdose deaths occurred in 2021. Okay, I see B. So actually, the correct answer is C, about 100,000. So these are some statistics from the NIH. Overall, you can see that they're going up. So in 2021, actually more than 106,000 people in the U.S. died from a drug-involved overdose. So this includes unintentional and intentional overdoses, as well as select illicit drugs and prescription drugs. You can also see in 2019 to 2020, there was a large increase and that's possibly due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And so this slide, the dose makes the poison. Really what I'm trying to get across is that anything can be toxic in high quantities, even water. So you may have heard about a situation a few years ago where somebody, there was a contest and they had ingested a large amount of water. It was just to see who could drink the most amount of water in a certain period of time. So people who ingest large amounts of water can develop hypervolemic hyponatremia, which has the possibility to be deadly. And in that competition, someone actually did die from that. So it's really interesting to think that anything can be toxic in high quantities, something even as simple as water. And so this slide is the poison control website. So the website is www.poison.org. So it includes all types of poisons, not just medications. So things such as if somebody were to have poisoning from antifreeze or perfume, hand sanitizer, batteries, anything like that, you can actually find that on here. So anytime you suspect a poisoning, it's important to contact 911 and a poison control uh, right away. Something I really do like about this website is they have a pill identifier, which is really easily available to anyone. So I know as pharmacists, we have so many resources that we use to have pill identifiers, but anybody has access to this. So it's a helpful resource for anybody in the community as well. So now we will talk about acetaminophen overdoses. So some epidemiology is that more than 60 million people in the U.S. consume acetaminophen on a weekly basis. And then each year, acetaminophen overdoses are responsible for 56,000 ED visits, 2,600 hospitalizations, and 500 deaths. And more than half of these overdoses are unintentional. So even though Tylenol is an over-the-counter medication, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's harmless. So the dosing, we're all likely pretty familiar with this, but for children, you dose it based on their weight. So 10 to 15 milligrams per kilogram per dose. There are some sources that still use age-based dosing, but this normally should not be used because some children are much larger or smaller than others, and that can lead to over or under dosing them. And then below that, in that picture for adults, we're very familiar with our regular strength and extra strength acetaminophen, as well as the extended release preparation. But regardless, the maximum daily dose for adults is still four grams. And these are just the acetaminophen products only, but there's so many combination products which can lead to an unintentional overdose, such as many over-the-counter cough and cold products may contain it, as well as there's some opioid and acetaminophen combinations as well. So for the pharmacokinetics, Adults, their peak absorption is within 30 minutes, so that's important to keep in mind for the management. 
And the peak plasma levels usually occur within four hours of the immediate release and more than four hours after ingesting the extended release. The elimination half-life for patients with hepatic dysfunction is up to 17 hours, which is a lot longer than other patients who don't have underlying hepatic dysfunction. It's only about two hours. So there's two different types of overdoses. There's acute overdoses and repeated supertherapeutic ingestion or RSTI. So for an acute overdose, that's defined as ingestion of a toxic amount within a period of less than or equal to eight hours. And so once you ingest 12 grams of acetaminophen, then you do have a very high risk of limer damage. Acute overdoses are rarely fatal though, especially when treated with acetylcysteine. And then RSTI, that's defined as more than one ingestion of acetaminophen over a period of more than eight hours, leading to a cumulative dose of more than four grams per day. This is actually the major cause of acetaminophen-induced death, not an acute overdose. So it's really important to understand the acetaminophen metabolism to understand too how we treat it. So as you can see in this diagram, acetaminophen undergoes either sulfonation or glucuronidation to the acetaminophen glucuronide or acetaminophen sulfate metabolite, and then it is excreted into the bile and urine and cleared from your body. So at therapeutic doses, this is how most acetaminophen is cleared, but there is a small amount that undergoes CYP2E1 metabolism to NAPQI, which is a toxic intermediate. So at therapeutic doses, NAPQI is then conjugated to glutathione and then metabolized and excreted in the kidney to mercapturic acid. Now, in the setting of an overdose, you're saturating the sulfonation and glucuronidation pathways, so you'll end up having more acetaminophen biotransformed by these cytochrome P450 enzymes to NAPQI. Most of the NAPQI binds to glutathione because you do have large stores of it in your liver, but there is some that can react with cellular proteins and nucleic acids that then cause toxicity and liver cell death. So for these patients, the liver can only handle a certain amount of this and be okay. And then within overtly toxic doses, your glutathione is depleted and your body's unable to make more in time while the NAPQI is actively damaging the liver cells and impairing their activity. Of note, patients with alcoholism have induction of CYP2E1, so they're actually at a higher risk for acetaminophen-induced liver injury since the pathway for metabolism is regularly ramped up. So those patients are at a higher risk. Now the symptoms present in four stages. So there's stage one, it's commonly asymptomatic. So this occurs within one to 24 hours after ingestion. And you can see a subclinical rise in serum transaminases, which is your ALT and AST. Stage two, that's 18 to 72 hours after ingestion. And you'll start to see more symptoms such as anorexia, nausea, vomiting, and right upper quadrant abdominal pain, as well as tachycardia and hypotension. So you'll still see those serum ALT and AST, PT, and bilirubin rise. And then you may actually see renal function abnormalities as well. Once you hit stage three, within 72 to 96 hours, that's your peak symptoms. So at that point, you'll see a large rise in your liver enzymes and hepatic necrosis would be diagnosed on a liver biopsy. So those patients commonly, if they have hepatic issues that can manifest as jaundice, coagulopathy, even hepatic encephalopathy, and then acute respiratory failure can develop in critically ill patients. If a patient were to succumb to the acetaminophen overdose, it would happen during stage three, because then stage four, which would occur four days to three weeks after ingestion, that's really just survival of critical illness seen in stage three. So at that point, you'll have complete resolution in the symptoms and your laboratory values will go back to normal. So for monitoring these patients, you want to obtain an acetaminophen level four hours after ingestion. You want to follow their serum electrolytes and their renal function, as well as all of their liver labs, like your ALT, AST, bilirubin, INR, and platelet count. Your INR and platelet count is more for assessment of liver function. It's not really used to manage the patient in an acute or RSTI overdose. Now, what's written in red is really important. So if you see your ALT and AST decreasing, but an INR that's increasing, 
that's very indicative of a poor prognosis. So that's because your liver is so necrotic from the damage that was done by the acetaminophen. By that point, you're in full-blown liver failure, and the ALT and AST can actually appear low because you have no more enzymes left. So it's really important when managing these patients, you don't fully rely on their ALT and AST to assess their liver function. So this is the treatment algorithm for the management of acute overdose. So the first thing you want to do is estimate your time of ingestion, either less than 24 hours since the overdose or greater than 24 hours. So if you're less than 24 hours and you present less than two hours after ingestion, you can administer activated charcoal to these patients. Next, you would want to get an acetaminophen level at four hours post-ingestion or as soon as possible, if later than that, to plot on the nomogram, which I'll discuss in a few slides. You can wait to start acetylcysteine until acetaminophen level is back, as long as the treatment is not delayed by more than eight hours after ingestion. If it has been more than eight hours after ingestion, you do wanna begin acetylcysteine. And going over to the right side of the diagram, if a patient presents more than 24 hours since their overdose, you wanna start them on acetylcysteine empirically and then follow the algorithm listed here for the management of RSTI. So step one, you do want to draw their serum ALT and AST, as well as an acetaminophen level. So if their ALT or AST is greater than 50, or their acetaminophen level is greater than 20, you want to treat with acetylcysteine for 12 hours and then reevaluate. You can consider discontinuing acetylcysteine if the patient is improving, so clinically improving, have an ALT and AST also improving, and their acetaminophen level is less than 10. Now, for patients who have an ALT and AST of less than 50 and an acetaminophen level less than 20, no further treatment is needed, and you can provide supportive care for these patients. So it's really important to notice the and and the or difference. So if you fall into a category where your ALT and AST is higher than 50 or acetaminophen greater than 20. It doesn't matter if you have both. If you have one of those criteria, you automatically would start acetylcysteine. So this is the RUMAC Matthew nomogram. So it's utilized as a tool to predict if liver toxicity will occur and to really allow clinicians to decide if they should proceed with acetylcysteine treatment. So over on this x-axis, you have your hours post-ingestion. So that starts at the four hour mark after ingestion, because by then that's when absorption of acetaminophen is considered to be complete. You also always want to use the earliest possible time of ingestion to account for the worst case scenario. And then on your y-axis, you have the acetaminophen plasma concentration. So that's your acetaminophen level. And then you'll also notice the treatment line and the rumac Matthew line. So the treatment line is actually 25% below the rumac Matthew line because it accounts for potential lab errors in reporting the level and then also errors in estimating the time from ingestion. So if you have a patient and your plot falls above the treatment line, you should give acetylcysteine. So an important consideration is the extended release formulation. It's a 650 milligram tablet that lasts for eight hours. So it's composed of 325 milligrams immediate release plus 325 milligrams of delayed release. So for patients who ingest this, there's the possibility for acetaminophen levels to plot below the treatment line of the nomogram at four hours, but then rise above the treatment line with that continued absorption. So you do wanna still get an acetaminophen level four hours after ingestion or as soon as possible. And so the recommendation is to obtain a second acetaminophen level four to six hours after the first measurement. Some studies recommend this, some don't, but really it's prudent since we don't have a lot of evidence to err on the side of caution and take two levels. Now, if you have one level that plots above the treatment line, you should administer the full course of acetylcysteine. But if you do have both levels below the treatment line, it's likely not causing toxicity and you may not need to treat with acetylcysteine, and if it was started, it may be able to be discontinued. So I know I went through the algorithm, but now I want to go through each of these a little bit further. So decontamination, acetylcysteine, and rarely patients can progress to needing a liver transplant if they do uh, make it to that point. So 
for decontamination. Our options are activated charcoal and gastric lavage. So activated charcoal, it works by absorbing acetaminophen, then inhibiting its GI absorption to prevent and limit the systemic toxicity. It actually can reduce the serum acetaminophen level and the need to start with acetylcysteine. So if a patient presents um, within one to two hours after an acute ingestion, it can be very, it has been shown to be effective, but there is limited data supporting efficacy after two hours of ingestion. It is contraindicated though in patients who are sedated or have diminished consciousness unless they have a protected airway. Gastric lavage is really, the layman's term is stomach pumping. So that's most effective if initiated within one hour of ingestion, but it's rarely used because there is a risk of complications and there hasn't been much efficacy shown with it. It also can increase your risk and severity of aspiration as well as cause possibly a GI perforation or hemorrhage. And it's also like activated charcoal, contraindicated in patients with an unprotected airway. Now our antidote, acetylcysteine. Remember the acetaminophen metabolism slide from before. This photo on the left is pretty much the same thing. So acetylcysteine is the precursor of glutathione. So glutathione is comprised of glutamine, cysteine, and glycine. And since glutathione is not bioavailable, you can't directly administer glutathione to a patient. And cysteine is the rate-limiting amino acid for glutathione formation. So by giving a patient acetylcysteine, you're really giving the liver the building blocks to make more glutathione. So overall, it'll increase your concentration of glutathione to, con to provide for the conjugation of NAPQI. It also actually enhances the sulfate conjugation for unmetabolized acetaminophen. So then you'll have more of the non-toxic metabolite. It also actually functions as an anti-inflammatory and antioxidant. Now for the dosing, there's two different regimens. There's the oral and IV. Oral is a 72 hour regimen versus IV is a 21 hour regimen. So some important differences and something to note is that it's weight-based dosing regardless of oral or IV administration. And for oral, it's a total of 18 doses and you have to repeat a dose if emesis occurs within one hour of administration. For IV, it's only three doses and um, it does have, there is an option for a two bag method and a one bag method that exists, but there is limited experience that exists with them. So it's rarely used and it's an off-label uh, dosing for acetylcysteine. And this is pretty much the same slide as before, just going over for a consideration. Patients who weigh over 100 kilograms, the doses for IV are basically the maximum doses listed on the last slide. Now, going into some of the adverse effects with IV versus oral, something to note is that I have heard the oral form tastes like rotten eggs, and considering you need 18 doses of it, it will be pretty difficult to keep down. And if you have to re-administer a dose after a patient has emesis, it'll be very difficult to get them to take all 18 doses. Now for the IV formulation, it does have way more side effects though. So that's important to keep in mind. There's a higher risk of that anaphylactoid reaction. So you can um, reduce the incidence of that by administering the initial IV loading dose over a period of 60 minutes for patients. And so this is just a screenshot of our acetylcysteine drug ingestion power plan. So you have the option for providers to either select oral or IV dosing. And here at Stony Brook, we do use the three bag system. And this is really helpful for all of my friends in the IV room and over at order entry because your dose is based on body weight. This is actually a screenshot from the package insert. Depending on their body weight, it tells you how many milliliters of acetylcysteine you need to add to each bag for patients who are going to be started on acetylcysteine treatment. So it's a really good reference in the package insert. And so to wrap up this section, we have a patient case. So we have patient AF, an 84-year-old female, found at home by her daughter after ingesting up to 24 tablets of Tylenol arthritis pain. Her daughter states yesterday she purchased a bottle of Tylenol arthritis and it wasn't open when she left to get groceries at 12 p.m. When she got back at 1 p.m., she found her mother sitting with the empty bottle and then called the poison control center and 911. She's presenting to the ED at 145, 
complaining of nausea and vomiting. Past medical history is significant for dementia. She's ANO times one, which is her baseline. She's afebrile, blood pressure is 140 over 82. Her rate is 90. Oxygen saturation is 97% on room air. Her labs are significant for an elevated serum creatinine from baseline and a slightly elevated ALT and AST. So should AF receive activated charcoal? Correct, yes. So she's presenting within the two hour window. So she is a candidate for activated charcoal. And so now we have her acetaminophen levels back. So at 4 p.m., which is four hours after she ingested it <clears throat> at approximately 12 p.m., her level came back as 100. And then four hours later at 8 p.m., her level came back as 90. So should this patient receive acetylcysteine? Yes. So the answer is yes. So technically her 4 p.m. level, so that was four hours after, her 4 p.m. level was 100, which is below the treatment line. But then her 8 p.m. level is actually 90, which is like just between the treatment line and the rumac Matthew line. This was a tricky question, but since one of the levels plots above the treatment line, she would be a candidate for acetylcysteine. Good job. So now going into benzodiazepine overdose. So this is very similar to that uh, graph I showed you before, but this one's specific for benzodiazepines. So like we saw earlier, it is on the rise and you do see that increase from 2019 to 2020, likely due to the COVID-19 pandemic. So going into the benzodiazepine mechanism of action and toxicity, benzodiazepines bind to the benzodiazepine receptors on the GABA chloride channels to help facilitate the binding of GABA to its receptor. So benzodiazepines come in different receptor types. There's two central benzodiazepine receptors, BZ1 and BZ2. And then there's peripheral benzodiazepine receptors as well. So it's interesting when you agonize the BZ1 receptor, you would see increased sedation. And then when you agonize the BZ2 receptor, you would actually see impairment of cognition, memory, and psychomotor function. So since benzodiazepines aren't selective for a particular receptor, that's why you do see a lot of therapeutic and their adverse events. So the onset of toxicity does occur within four hours as well. Now for the clinical presentation, if a patient has just a benzodiazepine overdose, they'll likely present with slurred speech, ataxia, nystagmus, altered mental status, and they can present with respiratory depression. It is uncommon though. And they likely have normal or near normal vital signs. And then many patients are actually arousable and can provide a history. Now, if they have a co-ingestion, such as ethanol or opioids, that's kind of where we see more of these severe effects, like the respiratory depression is more common, comatose state, hypotension, and hypothermia. Now, something of note is that propylene glycol is the diluent used for diazepam and lorazepam IV. So prolonged use can actually cause toxicity. So you got a patient on IV diazepam or, or lorazepam, and they have cardiac dysrhythmias, hypotension, a seizure, multi-system organ failure. There's a chance that it could be due to the propylene glycol in these preparations. Now, the monitoring parameters make a lot of sense knowing how our patients present. So, of course, you want to monitor their mental status, oxygen saturation and requirements, as well as their blood pressure. So, does anybody know the name of the antidote for a benzodiazepine overdose? D. D is correct. So it's flumazenil. So fomepazole, fomepazole is the antidote for an ethylene glycol or methanol overdose. Naloxone is for opioids. And then sodium thiosulfate is for cyanide poisoning. So our treatment options, pretty straightforward, also include decontamination, supportive care, and then flumazenil in select cases.
So for decontamination, this is the same slide as before, but really the one thing I do want to point out is that activated charcoal is only considered if a patient is presenting within one hour of ingestion. So with acetaminophen, it was less than two hours. Activated charcoal, it's less than one hour. So the same contraindications apply for activated charcoal and for gastric lavage, the same thing that I mentioned before, it's also rarely used and does carry those same risks. So for supportive care, pharmacologically, if a patient has hypotension, you would want to give fluid resuscitation. And if they have refractory hypotension, you may need to add on vasopressors. For non-pharmacologic, um, it's important if a patient has respiratory distress, um, respiratory depression, or respiratory failure, you may need to intubate them and provide mechanical ventilation. So now flumazenil, it works by antagonizing the action of benzodiazepines in the CNS by competitively displacing them by binding to the extracellular surface of GABA receptors. So it prevents further benzodiazepine binding. It's important to know that it only works for benzodiazepines and not for other drugs that affect GABA, such as barbiturates or IV or inhaled anesthetics, because it's very specific for the benzodiazepine receptors, not GABA in general. Now its indication is only for severe CNS and or respiratory depression following a benzodiazepine overdose. So it's really not recommended for the routine treatment for mild to moderate benzodiazepine overdoses. So going off of that, which patients should not receive flumazenil? So if a patient of course has a hypersensitivity to flumazenil or benzodiazepines or another component of it, if a patient's chronically maintained and physiologically dependent on benzodiazepines, or is receiving them for the treatment of possibly life-threatening conditions like control of ICP or a seizure disorder, they should not receive flumazenil. So in that circumstance, if you were to give them flumazenil, that would precipitate benzodiazepine withdrawal because they were physiologically dependent on them or chronically maintained. And so when you have a benzodiazepine withdrawal, one of the effects that you can see is a seizure. And of course, when a patient has a seizure, you usually treat seizures, with a benzodiazepine to control their seizure. But in this circumstance, if you gave flumazenil, you couldn't give them a benzodiazepine because of that, because the flumazenil is blocking the receptors that the benzodiazepine would need to bind to in order to work. So it's important to keep in mind, and for a patient who may have co-ingested a proconvulsant like a tricyclic antidepressant, or maybe showing signs of a tricyclic antidepressant overdose, it's very similar. I am kind of foreshadowing to my next section, but patients with TCA overdoses can experience seizures. So if you think they may have co-ingested a TCA with the benzodiazepine, you can induce a seizure by reversing the protective effect of the benzodiazepine. So this would really make their seizure more difficult to manage and it may require the use of propofol or barbiturates. So this is the dosing for flumazenil. One thing I do want to point out is the maximum cumulative dose is three milligrams. But if you have a partial response to three milligrams, you can actually titrate up to five milligrams. Now, if there's no response after five minutes of the cumulative dose of five milligrams, that's telling you their sedation is likely not due to a benzodiazepine overdose and may likely be due to another CNS depressant. So giving them additional dosing after that really wouldn't have any effect for them. So to wrap up this section, I have another patient case. <clears throat> so we have patient LK, a 35-year-old female, brought in by her husband at approximately 5 p.m. for slurred speech and altered mental status. He states he last saw her when he left the house at 7 a.m. when she was cooking breakfast. Her past medical history includes back pain, and she is prescribed diazepam five milligrams twice a day at home. In the ED, her blood pressure is 98 over 70. Her heart rate's in the 120s and her oxygen saturation is 96% on three liters of nasal cannula. Her blood alcohol level is less than 50, and her urine toxicology screen is positive for benzodiazepines. So how would you manage this patient's overdose? 
So the correct answer is actually B. So you wouldn't give flumazenil in this patient because they have chronic benzodiazepine use, so you could precipitate withdrawal. You wouldn't give them more of a benzodiazepine if they're presenting for a benzodiazepine overdose. And she wouldn't need to be intubated because she is saturating well on the three liters of nasal cannula. So now going into our last overdose, this is the tricyclic antidepressants or TCAs. <clears throat> so this slide similar to before, you do see um, it's lower than a lot of the other overdoses, but it also still is increasing as well. So it's important to understand a little bit of the background of tricyclic antidepressants. So on the right, that's the structure of one of them. Characteristic is that tricyclic, um, the three ring structure. So they were actually first to market um, was a mipramine in 1959, approved for the treatment of major depressive disorder. TCAs were really your primary drug class for depression until SSRIs were discovered. Um, but now SSRIs are used more frequently because they have less adverse effects. But TCAs do still play a role for patients with neuropathic pain and headaches. And so the mechanism of action, so they work by blocking the reuptake of serotonin and norepinephrine in the presynaptic terminals. That then causes increased concentration of these neurotransmitters in your synaptic cleft, which can then in turn lead to the antidepressant effect. So it's really important to note that TCAs work on a lot of different receptors. So they're competitive antagonists on postsynaptic alpha-1, muscarinic, histamine-1, GABA receptors, as well as cardiac fast sodium channels. So because of that, that's why you do see so many different types of adverse effects as a result when patients take these. So there are two types of TCAs. There's secondary and tertiary amines. So your secondary amines are more potent norepinephrine reuptake blocking. And then tertiary amines are actually have a more potent blocking reuptake of serotonin. So the tertiary, the secondary amines are actually um, associated with better tolerability because they um, have less histamine, muscarinic, and alpha receptor blockade versus your tertiary amines have more sedation and anticholinergic effects. So the toxicokinetics. TCAs do have that anticholinergic effect, like I had mentioned. So one of the effects of anticholinergic medications is you have decreased GI motility. So that can really delay the absorption and toxicity from a TCA overdose. For the distribution, respiratory or metabolic acidosis can actually increase the amount of unbound TCA and potentiate the harmful effects. So this is really important to keep in mind going forward when we talk about the different treatment options. They're also metabolized by CYP2D6, and toxicity can occur either because of the parent compound or one of its metabolites. And they're eliminated. It's a long uh, half-life elimination, hours to days, depending on the TCA. And then the onset of toxicity occurs within two hours after ingestion. And once significant toxicity occurs, usually lasts for about 24 to 48 hours. But there are some case reports that actually showed significant toxicity lasting a lot longer than that. So our clinical presentation makes a lot of sense with the receptors. I mentioned the TCAs antagonized. So you can see uh, sinus tachycardia, sedation, hypotension, seizures, altered mental status, anticholinergic effects, and then impaired cardiac conduction. So our anticholinergic effects, a lot of people remember it as mad as a hatter, which is your altered mental status, blind as a bat, that's your mydriasis, red as a beet is the flushed skin, Hot as a hair is the dry skin, and then dry as a bone is the dry mucous membranes. So the monitoring parameters are really important. So we do want to get a 12 lead EKG and then an EEG to monitor for seizures, as well as monitoring their vital signs and any change in mental status. Now our treatment options, of course, decontamination, like many other overdoses, and then pharmacologic supportive care, because they have so many adverse effects, there's different treatments for each of these adverse effects. So I'll go through each of these a little bit more in detail for you. So for decontamination, this is pretty much the same slide as before. Similarly to benzodiazepines, you would only consider activated charcoal within one hour of ingestion. 
with the same contraindications, and then gastric lavage, very similar, rarely used um, due to the lack of efficacy and increased risk of uh, complications that can result. So the impaired cardiac conduction, its mechanism, under normal circumstances, you have your voltage-gated sodium channels that permit the intracellular movement of sodium that's responsible for phase zero of the action potential. Phase zero, that's your depolarization. So that's where you see your influx of sodium and calcium. And TCAs actually block this action. So you may see intraventricular conduction delays and decreased inotropy, which would then cause a QRS widening, which is defined as greater than 100 milliseconds. So the QRS complex on your EKG represents the depolarization of the ventricles through those voltage-gated so voltage sodium channels and can correspond to phase zero of the action potential. And the widened QRS is actually associated with ventricular arrhythmias. TCAs also block the potassium channels, so that can then cause a delay in phase three potassium-dependent repolarization, which is your efflux of potassium. And then you can then see QT prolongation and an increased risk of torsades. Now, the treatment of this impaired cardiac conduction, the mainstay is sodium bicarbonate, administered as one to two milliequivalents per kilogram, followed by a continuous IV infusion. So its indication is for anybody who's hemodynamically unstable, has a seizure, TCA-induced impaired cardiac conduction, or that QRS widening, like I mentioned before. So its mechanism, I think, is very interesting. So the sodium loading can actually overcome the TCA blockade on those sodium channels. And then increasing your plasma pH is actually thought to increase the protein binding of TCAs. So therefore, you would have less free drug available to bind to sodium channels. So like I said before, for patients, um, if they present with acidosis, they may have more um, active TCAs within their system. So that's why alkalinization is important for these patients. So therefore your treatment goal, you want your pH to actually be between 7.45 to 7.55. And of course, it's important to monitor that acid base status as well as possibly for hypokalemia. Now, 3% saline can also be an option if a patient is too alkalotic after giving them sodium bicarbonate, or if they still have those cardiac conduction abnormalities despite giving sodium bicarbonate. So like I mentioned before, we want to avoid acidosis. So this is a study, it was on the impact of alkalinization on QRS interval and TCA poisoning. So their primary objectives they really wanted to quantify the effects of sodium bicarbonate and mechanical ventilation on pH and sodium levels to determine which treatment is optimal for serum alkalinization. Their secondary outcome was to determine if dual therapy had more rapid narrowing of the QRS when compared with other treatments. So the study design, it was actually a retrospective chart review for patients across three toxicology services who had acute TCA poisoning between January 2013 and November 2019 in Australia. So their methods, they defined a widened QRS interval as greater than 110 milliseconds. And then a therapeutic response was defined as narrowing of a QRS to either a decrease of more than 30 milliseconds or getting that QRS less than 100. Patients were then grouped according to whether they received sodium bicarbonate and or mechanical ventilation or just supportive care. So here on this slide, their inclusion criteria, they included anybody who ingested at least 10 milligrams per kilogram of a TCA. The primary diagnosis of TCA overdose, um, if they didn't have an undocumented, if they had an undocumented dose, they really based it off of their clinical severity. So if they had a QRS greater than 110, a mean arterial pressure less than 65, which is considered prolonged hypertension, hypotension, or a Glasgow coma scale, of, or GCS less than eight, that's considered for a patient to be comatose. So they utilize that if they didn't have a documented dosage because having those clinical features kind of indicated a likely dosage of greater than 10 milligrams per kilogram were ingested. Now for the population, there was a total of 210 patients. And I do want to point out that most of the patients were in the sodium bicarbonate and ventilation arm. And then there was only 12 in the sodium bicarbonate only arm and 46 actually in the ventilation only arm and then 68 in supportive care only. 
<clears throat> now for the results, it showed that dual therapy patients at baseline had ingested a significantly higher median TCA dose, had a longer median maximum QRS interval, and were more likely to have seizures and arrhythmias. But this makes a lot of sense because these patients had a more severe overdose since they needed to be intubated. Dual therapy actually had a greater median increase in serum pH and had more patients reach the target pH of that 7.45 to 7.55. And they also saw that for every 100 millimole bolus of sodium bicarbonate, the median increase in serum sodium was 2.5. Now that's equivalent to our units. I know they use millimoles in the study, but here we use milli equivalents. It actually is equal. And then QRS narrowing actually occurred twice as quickly for patients who were receiving sodium bicarbonate and were mechanically ventilated versus the other treatment groups. So what did this study tell us? It told us that a combination of sodium bicarbonate and mechanical ventilation was the most effective to achieve alkalinization and was associated with a more rapid narrowing of the QRS. They also recommended the maximal dose of sodium bicarbonate should be limited to less than 400 to prevent hypernatremia because we know increasing sodium by more than 10 in 24 hours can actually run the risk of central pontine myelinolysis, which is deadly. Now, the limitations are something that are really important to discuss. So for co-ingestions, it was difficult for them to really evaluate the TCA clinical effects because they did include patients who had ingested something else as well. So you couldn't necessarily separate out what effects were from the TCA overdose versus the other agent they ingested. They also included patients who self-reported an overdose on TCAs. So they stated that they thought that these patients were telling the truth, but you know, you never know because there is no documented um, like diagnosis that they did receive the TCAs. You're basically just trusting them that they would be telling the truth. Something else is that there's no standardized management protocol between these centers. Like I said, it was three different centers. There's also no guidelines for the management of TCA overdoses. So it's really difficult. Certain institutions may have had different thresholds for when to initiate mechanical ventilation or when to give sodium bicarbonate. It also only focused on the biochemical and EKG implications, not clinical outcomes. So it's great that sodium bicarbonate and mechanical ventilations were more effective to achieve that alkalinization and rapidly lower their QRS, but that really doesn't say anything about how they ended up. Like, did they survive after this? Were they having improvement in their clinical picture? We really wouldn't know. So that really um, allows us to kind of beg the question for, we need more studies to show that this is actually effective. And the majority, um, there were some patients who had severe toxicities like the hypotension, seizures, arrhythmias, death. And the majority of those patients were in the dual therapy group. So as for arrhythmias, really goes hand in hand with the cardiac conduction abnormalities. So arrhythmias can actually improve after giving someone sodium bicarbonate, but you do want to consider some of these treatments if a patient has persistent or life-threatening arrhythmias. So your options include lidocaine and magnesium sulfate. For lidocaine, it's for ventricular arrhythmias that may be refractory um, to giving sodium bicarbonate and 3% saline, or if a patient has severe alkalosis or they are hypernatremic, and then that limits the use. Magnesium sulfate is very similar for patients with arrhythmias that are refractory to sodium bicarbonate. So you do want to make sure you're using caution if you're utilizing medications for tachycardia because of the rebound bradycardia potential. And you want to avoid class 1A, 1C, and 3 antiarrhythmics, which makes a lot of sense because our class 1 um, antiarrhythmics are sodium channel blockers, and our class 3 antiarrhythmics are potassium channel blockers. So they basically have the same effect on the heart. So that's why they can cause that worsening cardiotoxicity. Now for hypotension, this is due to the blockade of alpha-1 adrenergic receptors. So very similarly, you would provide fluid resuscitation first, and then if they are refractory hypotension, you can consider adding on a vasopressor. And for seizures, so TCA overdoses, as I alluded to before, can cause seizures. So it's likely due to the central GABA-A receptor inhibition. So the first line treatment is benzodiazepines. And refractory seizures, then you can administer barbiturates or propofol, 
It's important to note, though, that they can cause hypotension, and many patients do present with hypotension. So it makes sense that benzodiazepines are our first line. They are safer, and they act on those GABA-A receptors um, that are being blocked by the TCAs. And then of note, we also don't use anti-epileptics such as phenytoin because they act on the sodium channels. And like we just discussed, sodium channels are commonly blocked by TCAs and can cause a lot of other problems. So a lot of this is just an FYI, but your options for benzodiazepines include lorazepam, diazepam, and midazolam. So lorazepam does have a fast onset of action when administered IV. Diazepam does have that rectal administration option as well. So if a patient doesn't have IV access, you may need to give diazepam or midazolam is available IM too, but it does have a later onset than lorazepam. So something to keep in mind. And then our other options like the propofol and phenobarbital. For propofol, it's important to know that patients have to be mechanically ventilated and need cardiovascular monitoring. So if you have a patient with a TCA overdose and they're on a general medicine floor, they can't receive propofol. And then phenobarbital, patients may actually need additional respiratory support as well when um, maximizing their loading dose or having concurrent sedative therapy. Now, something I just want to mention quickly is physostigmine. So it's actually an antidote for anticholinergic poisoning. So it works by inhibiting acetylcholinesterase, which is the enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine. So you're prolonging the central and peripheral effects of acetylcholine. But it's interesting that it's actually contraindicated in TCA overdoses because there's been case reports showing asystole and seizures can result. So asystole is due to having an increased cholinergic tone of the vagus nerve and slowed AV conduction leading to bradycardia and death. So TCAs and physostigmine actually act synergistically and can be deadly when combined. Now, if a patient has an anticholinergic overdose, not from a TCA overdose, they need to have a normal QRS interval to receive physostigmine. And then seizures can actually occur if it's administered too rapidly, which would be faster than one milligram per minute. And so to wrap up this section, I have another patient case. We have patient DW, a 55-year-old female, brought in by EMS at approximately 12 p.m. Her friend at bedside stated she came to her house to check on her when she sent her a strange text. And then upon arrival, she saw her laying on the couch with an empty bottle of desipramine, 100 milligrams, that initially contained 60 capsules. And then she saw a receipt on the floor showing that she actually picked it up today. So she brought her into the ED, and there her blood pressure was 93 over 55, heart rate 150, oxygen saturation 94% on three liters of nasal cannula, her ABG shows a pH of 7.28, and her urine toxicology screen was positive for LSD and amphetamines. So they get an EKG, and it shows sinus tachycardia with a QRS interval of 170. So which of the following medications would be appropriate to manage this patient's overdose? So the correct answer here is D. So lidocaine is wrong because you wouldn't administer lidocaine first. Um, Physostigmine is wrong because it's contraindicated in a TCA overdose. And then dofetilide is wrong because that's a class three antiarrhythmic. So you want to make sure you avoid these because of the worsening cardiotoxicity. So I also did try to kind of throw you off with the urine toxicology screen being positive for LSD and amphetamines. So it's actually interesting that desipramine can cause a false positive result for LSD and amphetamines. So this is commonly something we may see if you were working in the ED, a patient, you may not be able to fully trust the urine toxicology screen because a lot of antidepressants and medications that work within the CNS can cause false positives for other um, substances. So just to conclude, here are treatment options for acetaminophen, benzodiazepine, and tricyclic antidepressant overdoses. Thank you all so much for coming. Does anybody have any questions?
Thank you, Denise. So since I don't see any questions, I will send you all the post-assessment questions. And thank you all so much for coming today. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Thank you, Rick. Thanks for coming.